Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Kernel security updates fix several issues in Ubuntu. LibreOffice 6.3.6 is the final update to 6.3, which is going EOL. Sophos Firewall falls victim to the In the Wild SQL injection attack. Revolutionary new tech means you can touch things in VR. And Google has released the AI code for Tapas as open source software. Stick around, the full details in this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Canonical has published new Ubuntu Linux kernel security updates for all of its supported releases to patch several vulnerabilities discovered lately by various security researchers. Affecting Linux 4.15, 4.4, and 5.3 kernels in several versions of Ubuntu Linux, the new security patch fixes an issue found in the Intel Wi-Fi driver, a race condition discovered in Linux kernel's virtual terminal implementation, a flaw discovered in the floppy driver, and a race condition in the block I.O. tracing implementation. All these issues could allow a local attacker to either crash the system or expose sensitive information. The new kernel update also patches a stack buffer overflow discovered in the vhostnet driver. This could allow a local attacker with the ability to perform IOCTL calls on dev vhost.net to cause a denial of service crashing the system. That's just to name a few of the critical security issues that have been patched. Canonical urges all users to update their installations and install the new kernel versions as soon as possible. New kernel versions are also available for Raspberry Pi devices, cloud environments, OEM processors, Snapdragon processors, as well as Amazon Web Services, Microsoft Azure Cloud, Oracle Cloud, Google Cloud Platform, and Google Container Engine systems. Keep in mind when updating a production system that a system reboot is required for the security issues to be corrected, so it's best to schedule a short downtime to perform this update. The Document Foundation has announced the release of LibreOffice 6.3.6 as the sixth and final update of the 6.3 series, which will reach end of life at the end of this month. Coming more than two months after LibreOffice 6.3.5, the LibreOffice 6.3.6 update is here to provide users of the LibreOffice 6.3 series with one last set of bug and regression fixes. It also aims to improve document compatibility. The LibreOffice 6.3 series is targeted at enterprise deployments and production environments. When LibreOffice 6.4 is already available, 6.3 is the only, only version currently recommended by the Document Foundation for organizations. That said, LibreOffice 6.3 is set to reach end of life on May 29, 2020, and this is the last update. If you're running LibreOffice 6.3 in your organization, it would be best to update to version 6.3.6 as soon as possible and start considering upgrading your 6.3 installations to the 6.4 series in the coming weeks. The current release of LibreOffice is uh, 6.4.3, which will be considered ready for enterprise deployment by the next point release, which should be out by the end of the month. Until then, you can get either version from now, or you can get either version now from the official LibreOffice website. Binaries are provided for Deb and RPM-based distros, or you can install the latest release from the stable software repositories of your Linux distribution. Welcome back to the Crypto Corner. Hope you're all well. Um, today we'll only have two headlines. The first one will be the halving, and the second one will be DCEP. Now, the halving occurs every 210,000 blocks, or roughly every four years, and reduces the block subsidy, so the money that the miners are getting, by around 50%. Currently, that is 12.5 uh, Bitcoin every 10 minutes, and it will be reduced to 6.25 um, after around the 12th of May. As you can see behind me, <clears throat> there is a clock. The upper time is based on the current block time. So it takes around 8.8 .8 minutes, not 10 minutes, to mine a block. And the reason is that everybody that has got an ASICS miner 
switched the machine on to take advantage of the current still 12 and a half Bitcoin that the system uh, emits every around 10 minutes or currently every eight and a half minutes. So you have to watch the upper time because that is the one that counts. There is no time within the uh, Bitcoin blockchain. It's just a block. And every block, as I said, takes around 10 minutes to be mined. And so there's this time difference coming from. Now, um, how do you say it correctly? Is it halving or halvening? I was asked, well, you can use both. Um, in, the, in the blockchain itself, in the code, it says halving. It's hardwired in there, hard-coded in there. And if you want to take a look into that, also the 210,000 blocks is hard-coded in there. You go into github.com, then into the blockchain uh, uh, GitHub, and there into the set, uh, directory SCR, and there you search for a file called validate.cpp. Uh, in there, you just do a control F to find, uh, to search for uh, uh, a halving, and you'll find it there. And you'll find also the formula in there. And the other one with the 210,000 blocks, you'll find in a, in a file called chainparms.cpp. And um, the other question is, okay, what happens after the, uh, let's say, that's 12th of May or 11th of May, whenever that halving happens, will the Bitcoin uh, system crash? No, it won't, because it's not the first time. It's not the third time that this happens. <clears throat> and, um, and the miners that have got old machines or not operating uh, economically anymore will just switch off their machines or will move to another network. There are plenty of other networks that accept uh, or that, that can work with ASIC machines. So only the best machines will continue working on the Bitcoin blockchain that has always been like that. <clears throat> Just to remind you back in 2013 when somebody came up with the ASIC for the first time, all those uh, GPS miners, uh, GPU miners, sorry, the GPU miners were obsolete and could be switched off because none of them were really mining any Bitcoins anymore. Um, so it, life will continue. And uh, also, if let's say a substantial amount of Bitcoiners switch off their machines, then as it's currently happening with the time, the time will be inverted. So it will take longer than 10 minutes to mine a Bitcoin, and, uh, to, um, uh, to mine a block. And, uh, and after 2016 blocks, the difficulty will be adjusted anyway, and it will be back to the usual 10 minutes. So there's nothing to worry about. This is a natural... Uh, uh, effect that happens on the blockchain, on the Bitcoin blockchain, uh, and it's not the first time, it's the third time that this is happening now. Uh, but just uh, just take a look out. I mean, it's an interesting it's an interesting thing that's happening because it will reduce the, the subsidy <coughs> or the inflation rate from the Bitcoin blockchain to around only 1.79 percent. Now, the second one will be effect will be really is, is a really interesting one. It's called DCEP, and it's translated into Digital Currency Electronic Payment. And that is the renminbi of China on a blockchain. So that happened now, as we at Category 5 announced it back in December last year. They have done it now. They're rolling it out, <clears throat> and it will have, I'm pretty sure, global implications. So um, they're gradually replacing the paper money with the blockchain money. And as you probably know from China, if you go to a small market, and you want to buy something very cheap, uh, you don't buy it with cash anymore. You pay there with your cell phone. A little bit like Apple Pay, they have got their systems and everybody has got that over there. They don't, sometimes they don't even accept credit cards anymore. And in future, it will be only this famous DCEP. And uh, you'll see uh, two charts in a second behind me. One is a picture of that uh, cell phone uh, um, application and the other one is just a comparison to cash and and other uh, valuables now <clears throat> they're rolling it out very carefully it's only in, uh, in a few cities where they're rolling it out and testing it they will be uh, involving uh, huge vendors like mcdonald's uh, starbucks uh, that will be testing in these cities um, the the dcep uh, at a stage, every merchant must accept the DCEP uh, because it's the official currency of, uh, of China. It is a blockchain um, based on many uh, things that we know from our blockchain industry. 
will be incorporated in there with the only one big difference, it's centralized. And what does that mean? So if the government in China or the Central Bank of China decides <clears throat> to do something, then everybody will have to follow that. And that means that, for example, if they give you some money or you have got some money in your, in your wallet, then they can tell you where to spend it. You can't do anything against that because it's not paper anymore. You cannot just go somewhere and pay with cash. You have to pay with a DCEP and they can tell you where to buy it. And um, the question I will be asked, well, what happens with us here? It's the similar, it's going to be similar. Just wait a few years. I mean, not to the extreme that they will tell us uh, what, we're, what to do and not to do with the money because that will be a little revolution in the Western world. But if the government gives you $1,200, they can decide where to spend, where you, they want you to spend it. And that can be regulated and done through a, a digital currency. So watch out. We'll keep you informed on this here. And that's it uh, from me here at the Crypto Corner. I wish you a fantastic week uh, and that things may pan out the way you want to, them to be panned out. So hope to see you next week. Thank you for watching. Thanks, Robert. Just a reminder, we're not giving you financial advice here on the show. Rather, we're simply giving you the facts and leaving it up to you. And now back to Becca. Thank you, Robbie. Users of a widely used firewall from Sophos have been under a zero day attack that was designed to steal usernames, cryptographically protected passwords and other sensitive data. The well-researched and developed attack exploited an SQL injection flow flaw in fully patched versions of the Sophos XG firewall. With that toehold in systems, it downloaded and installed a series of scripts that ultimately executed code intended to make off with users' real names, usernames, the cryptographically hashed form of the passwords, and the salted SHA-256 hash of the administrator account's password. Sophos has delivered a hotfix that mitigates the vulnerability. Other data? Targeted by the attack included an IP address allocation permissions for firewall users, system information such as running OS and version, uptime and network configuration, as well as the ARP tables used to map IP addresses to device MAC addresses. Sophos researchers wrote in Sunday's disclosure, this malware's primary task appeared to be data theft, which it could perform by retrieving the contents of various database tables stored in the firewall, as well as by running some operating system commands. The exploits also downloaded the malware from domains that appeared in the le to be legitimate. To evade detection, some of the malware deleted underlying files that executed it and ran solely in memory. The malicious code uses a creative and roundabout method to ensure it's executed, it's executed each time firewalls are started. Those characteristics strongly suggest that the threat actors spent weeks or months laying the groundwork for the attacks. The data the malware was designed to exfiltrate suggests the attack was designed to give attackers the means to further penetrate the organizations that use the firewall through phishing attacks and unauthorized access to user accounts. The zero-day vulnerability that made the attacks possible was a pre-authentication SQL injection flaw found in the custom operating system that runs the firewall. Sophos provided no additional details about the vulnerability. Users of vulnerable firewalls should ensure the hotfix is installed as soon as possible and then examine their systems for signs of compromise published on the Sophos news site. As the fix is part of the automatic e update ecosystem, Ensure your firewall has these enabled to receive the fix. A new lightweight virtual reality device has been created that would allow users to touch objects at shops and museums without ever having to go there in the flesh. The limits of virtual reality have been stretched in the last five years. The technology has become the medium of choice for game developers, artists, and actors alike, seeing a real boom in projects that bring us alternate realities during enforced social isolation. Through immersive audio and visual landscapes, the ability to visit mind-blowing locations, real or not, is on the brink of becoming an affordable option for many. Nowadays, what you see and hear in virtual reality is not so dissimilar from actually visiting these places. However, up until now, the experience did not give us the ability to physically interact with surrounding environments. Chris Harrison, assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon's University, 
Human Computer Interaction Institute says, Elements such as walls, furniture, and virtual characters are key to building immersive, immersive virtual worlds, and yet contemporary VR systems do little more than vibrate hand controllers. A team at the Pennsylvania University has created a new device that uses haptic feedback, a technology which stimulates the sensation of touch to make the virtual experience seem more real. Where other devices might use a series of expensive, power-hungry motors to give the sensation of touch, their design uses a simpler mechanical solution. From a shoulder-mounted system, a string is attached to each finger, giving resistance based on what the user should be feeling. A spring-loaded mechanism is combined with an electric latch that stops the hand from moving further as it makes contact with heavy objects in the virtual world. Kathy Fang, co-author of the study, says, I think the experience creates surprises, such as when you interact with a railing and can wrap your fingers around it. Fang said the system would be suitable for VR games and experiences that involve interacting with physical obstacles and objects, such as a maze. It might also be used for visits to virtual museums. And in a time when physically visiting retail stores is not always possible, she says, you might also use it to shop in a furniture store. While their research shows that this method provides a much more realistic sense of touch, the team says that a mass-produced version, when, re when ready, could be available to the public for less than $50. Google has released the code for their internally developed artificial intelligence, Tapas. It can take a natural language question such as, what's the name of the latest iPhone, and fetch the answer from a relational database or spreadsheet, and it's now open source. The search giant's researchers detailed the AI on Thursday. Tapas is based on BERT, a natural language processing technique that Google uses in its search engine. A sizable portion of the world's information is relational, that is to say, organized into rows and columns. Navigating from these rows and columns historically required either manually sif uh, shift sifting through a spreadsheet or writing SQL queries. Natural language processing makes the task considerably easier for users, which is why the technology has been extensively adopted by Google and other players in the analytics market. The search giant says that the tapas beats or matches the three top open source algorithms for parsing relational data. They trained the AI on 6.2 million tables from the English version of Wikipedia and then set it to work on a trio of academic data sets. Benchmark tests that showed that the neural network provides accurate comparable answers as the rival algorithms across all three data sets. The type of language processing Google has implemented into Tapas allows the AI to consider not only the question posed by users and the data they wish to query, but also the structure of the relational tables in which the data is stored. Tapas can go beyond just fetching data and also perform basic calculations. For example, if a business user evaluating sales data asks for the average revenue across their company's three most popular products, the AI would reply with the calculated answer, not just the data set. Tapas is available now on the Google Research GitHub repository. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.tv newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson.